Hi, friends. Uh, I'm excited to get to have a chance to talk to you a bit about worship. And in particular, I want to think with you about a kind of transformation in my understanding of worship that's taken place over the last several years. In particular, uh, I will give credit to a longtime friend of mine, a guy named Jamie Smith. He writes under the name James K.A. Smith. And in particular, the work he does in books like Desiring the Kingdom or You Are What You Love. Jamie has really helped me think about two aspects of worship that are really critical. But before I get into that, uh, I want to think about a text out of Romans, the 12th chapter, uh, probably a familiar text. So I'm going to read it in an unfamiliar way. Uh, read it out of Eugene Peterson's The Message. This is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. I love that text. And in particular, in some other translations, Paul will say, don't, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So here's the two things that Jamie has really helped me with in thinking about worship. First of all, he calls them cultural liturgies. It's a recognition that all of the time, to use Paul's language, we're being squeezed into the world's mold, or in Peterson's translation, uh, don't be influenced by the culture. It's interesting that the word culture actually has the same root word as cult, um, that we are being shaped in certain ways. And Jamie will say, we are always worshiping. The, the challenge is we don't recognize it. We don't always know it. We're participating in, again, what Jamie would call cultural liturgies that frame and shape us all the time. Um, in Desiring the Kingdom, he opens by thinking about Martians coming to earth to study humans, and they end up following humans to a place they think is a great cathedral, but it turns out that's just the mall, uh, the shopping mall. But in some ways, it's religious. The only windows are in the in the sky or in the ceiling. Um, there's no clocks on the wall. There are these little chapels, Jamie says. But rather than having flat, uh, one-dimensional icons like stained glass windows, they have three-dimensional icons drawing you in telling you what the good life looks like. And then you go into the chapel and an acolyte greets you and takes you on your, you know, through this quest, through the racks. And finally you find what you're looking for and you go to the priest and there's this exchange. You give them what you have and then they wrap in the colors of the seasons of the year this this gift that they give to you and then they send you off with a benediction. Go and shop again. It's a fascinating reading and a fascinating way to think about the mall. Uh, years ago, part of the reason Jamie and I became friends, we spent a summer together and our children, are, our four kids are exactly the same age. And so uh, these eight kids hung around together all summer long. Our families really got to know each other well in the study program we were a part of. But I asked Jamie years ago after reading the book, do your kids go to the mall, Jamie? He said, of course, of course they do. But um, when they ask for the keys of the car, they say, hey, Dad, can we have the keys? We're going to the Temple of Consumption. <laughs> and we laughed about that. And he said, at least, at least they know what it's trying to do to them. And that's the key, is that we're participating all the time. And, and Jamie wants to think about the mall and, and about the arena. Uh, a friend of mine, one night we went to an NBA basketball game, and uh, my friend's been deeply influenced by Jamie's thought too. And we spent the whole night thinking about this worship that we were doing. We, we, were per we dressed for worship. There was a call to worship outside the arena. We were eating, we joked, Eucharistic food when we took the nachos and our Diet Cokes. Um, but there is a, a kind of drawing into, for example, rituals of nationalism. Um, how does education form us? All the time in my work across the street from where I am right now at Northwest Nazarene University, I think about what are the cultural liturgies? What are the liturgies that are most formative in the lives of students? Is it actually class or is it life in the dorm? Is it is it chapel worship that's most formative or is it uh, the kind of get-togethers and parties that they're a part of or is it athletics? What are the things that are most forming them? And so the first aspect of worship is to think how are we being squeezed into the world's molds? Uh, how can we take a kind of cultural liturgy to say, what are the things that are shaping and forming us most? And here's the second aspect, so that we can not only recognize how the world's trying to squeeze us into its mold, but we can also then offer our bodies as living sacrifices, Paul says, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So how can we commit ourselves to worship practices that then intentionally counterform us to be reflections of the Christ that we worship? And this is where I think it becomes very important then to think about not only regular participation in worship as a community, 
but what are the practices that we're doing when we get there? Um, are those practices practices that are actually forming us to be Christians, but, but actually Christian consumers, not Christian servants of each other? And so I often say to new members of my church, when, when you think about joining this church, don't ask, do you like it? Ask, are we doing to you what we should do to you? And some of the things worship should do to us, it should give us a sense that we're being called to worship. And we just didn't just choose to worship, but that God has indeed invited and called us to worship. Uh, this worship should invite us to bring what we have, both praises and also offerings, the good things, but it also invites us to bring the difficult things, our our confession of sin, our our prayers and petitions, our needs, our laments, um, our desire for God to act. We should come expecting to receive both the blessing of the presence of Christ when, when we pass the peace or when we are present with brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to be received from God's word and from uh, the Eucharistic presence, the body and blood of Christ that we receive as a means of grace. But then we also come to be prepared to be sent back into the world, uh, to be instruments of of Christ's peace and to be what we have come to gather to become today, to be the body of Christ, not just gathered, but then scattered and sent into the world. And somehow that rhythm then counterforms us, whether that's keeping time with the rhythms of the church year of Advent and Epiphany and Lent and Easter, or whether that's just the very rhythms of worship itself, we are being counterformed uh, to be transformed by his grace. Um, in some ways, that's so simple, uh, recognizing, like putting on a cultural pair of glasses to see the way the world's squeezing us into its mold, and, you know, intentionality at being formed in certain ways in worship. But at the same time, it's really difficult. It's really difficult because we don't really pay attention to the ways that we're being transformed. And sometimes we're far more interested in being entertained in worship than we are in being transformed through it. And so that's just a few thoughts um, to maybe be a springboard to all sorts of thoughts and discussions. Um, But I'm excited about this issue on worship and delighted to get to talk with you just a little bit about it.